Despite being one of the most experienced, most talked about, and most recognizable talents of the 2020 NFL Draft, Justin Herbert is easily the biggest mystery in this entire class. I have watched every single game from Oregon's 2019 schedule, multiple times over even, and I still don't 100% know what to think of him. One play, he's making an incredible throw, off-platform, under pressure that very few NFL quarterbacks could ever dream of making. And on the next play, he's throwing a boneheaded interception or just flat out not reading the defense efficiently. The highs are incredibly high and the lows are incredibly low, but unfortunately for general managers around the league this year, that inconsistency is a recipe for a very, very hard evaluation. In fact, I would venture to say that out of every prospect I've watched so far this pre-draft season, Justin Herbert was by far the most difficult for me to figure out. But in the end, I think I'm going to get as close as anyone really can to laying out the good, the bad, and the flat-out ugly of Herbert's tape. Before we get into all that, though, I do want to thank our sponsor that has so graciously stepped up to support the channel this week, Raid Shadow Legends. I'm not gonna lie, I don't play a lot of mobile games, usually the aesthetic and the controls don't really do it for me, most of the time I just stick to PC, but Raid is genuinely really fun to pass the time with, which we have a lot of time these days, obviously. The graphics are stunning to me as someone who grew up playing Snake on an old Nokia brick phone, the UI is intuitive, I'm a sucker for RPGs that have a lot of loot progression and customization too, and it's a really great game for me to just pick up and play for 10-15 to 15 minutes at a time while I'm rendering videos or just waiting for my dinner to cook on the stove. Also, the daily login rewards program for new players like me has been doubled from 90 to 180 days. That means each day you can claim your free rewards from energy refills to silver and gems to shards and a free barbarian legendary champion, Sill of the Drakes. I don't have to commit a whole lot of time to it like I do to Diablo or Dota, and it's just fun to mess around with. Plus, it's free to play, so that's a big bonus too. If you're getting bored of your game backlog and you want to try out a fun, beautiful, and free RPG that can be played on both mobile and desktop devices, check out the link in the description below and you'll get 50,000 silver and a free epic champion as part of Raid's new player program to start your journey. And with that, let's get back to talking about something that is much less fun than Raid, Justin Herbert's tape. The thing you have to understand about Herbert is that the Oregon offense, just by its very nature, was not very aggressive or creative when it came to the passing game. Literally half of Herbert's attempts last year were within five yards of the line of scrimmage, and believe it or not, his percentage of screen passes out of his overall passing attempts, 23.2%, was by far the highest number I've seen in a potential top 10 pick at quarterback. For context, no starting NFL quarterback has ever thrown screen passes at that rate over a full season in the pros, and the only one who even comes close, Kyler Murray last year, still only threw screens 18.3% of the time. And not only that, a huge portion of the deep shots that Oregon did throw were off of pump and goes to fake screens outside, where the blockers just released up the field and had tons of open grass in front of them, so it's not like Herbert was aggressively attacking tight windows all the time either. The Oregon offensive philosophy was designed to create massive windows and very simple reads, so truth be told, Herbert wasn't asked to do a whole lot compared to some other prospects in this class. That's part of what made this evaluation so difficult, was trying to figure out what I could hold against Herbert and what I should hold against his coaches instead, and there's a very fine line when it comes to giving a final grade for a prospect. But even taking all of that into account, there were still enough, shall we say, NFL-style throws sprinkled in throughout the year that I could at least get an idea of what to expect from Herbert at the next level. And the results from those throws were, well, let's just say polarizing at best. Any analyst or scout's opinion on Herbert will be wildly different based on which games they ended up watching from him. If they turned on his tape against Colorado, for instance, he looked like an absolute world beater, a truly rare and gifted quarterback talent that would be an easy top five pick in almost any draft class. But if they watched the Auburn, Cal, or ASU games, he looked like a day two developmental prospect at best. From week to week, series to series, sometimes even play to play, he looked like two totally different quarterbacks. And at least for me personally, that drove me absolutely insane. I never knew what I was going to get from Herbert, either good or bad, and if I was a general manager trying to save my own job by picking a young quarterback, that Jekyll and Hyde act would scare the hell out of me. And you know what? I think it scared the hell out of Herbert's own coaching staff sometimes too. 
There were a few games where I honestly felt like Mario Cristobal and Marcus Arroyo did not trust him to execute, and that's a huge red flag for me. Take the Auburn game for instance, because that one was probably the most egregious example. This play is from a little over halfway through the third quarter when Oregon had a commanding 21-6 lead, but there was still plenty of clock left and Herbert faced a pretty daunting 3rd and 16 situation from inside his own red zone. Now, you might think that an offense as conservative as Oregon's might just run the ball here, punt, and live to see another series, but Arroyo actually got fairly aggressive for once and called a dagger concept from a 3x1 trio set. And the thing with dagger, as you'll probably remember from any of the other many times I've highlighted this concept before, is that it's a very versatile route combination that can work against a variety of zone coverages in long yarded situations. It's a really good play call for this down and distance, and one that Herbert theoretically should be able to execute well. The dig route from the number one outside is obviously the primary read, but these go routes from number two and number three can also be huge gains as alert reads on the play if the defense busts their coverage. Number three is the alert if nobody carries him up the middle seam against a two deep safety shell, and the number two can also be an alert if this free safety takes the number three inside and just lets him keep on running. So the quarterback always has to be aware of those two alerts first. But if the defense does what they're supposed to and covers both of them, that's when the dig from the number one comes into play as the primary read that will be open more often than not. Again, all Herbert has to do here is just execute the play as it was designed. The number three gets carried by the Mike linebacker, which leaves a huge void over the middle for the dig to come free. He just has to wait for the dig to clear the hook zone defender and let it rip. That's it. Right this second, at this pause, Herbert should be starting his release to show off his arm and throw right into that soft spot in the coverage. He has the talent to zip it high enough to clear the linebacker and drop it into the window, but for some reason he just doesn't do it. I don't know why he got spooked out of pulling the trigger, the throw was as open as it was ever going to get, and certainly more open than it would have been in the NFL, but instead he just opted to tuck, run for a few yards, and punt the ball away. And as frustrating as that probably was for you to watch happen only once, you could pull up plays like that in almost every game. So it's no wonder why Herbert's coaches at Oregon changed their play calls around him. There's just something about throwing the ball down the field on traditional passing concepts that have a lot of layers to the reads that really gives Herbert trouble sometimes. And I think that Cristobal and Arroyo knew that, so they protected him from it as much as possible. Literally for the rest of that game against Auburn, until the final two plays of the last minute of the game, one of which was a Hail Mary, Herbert did not throw another pass more than four yards down the field. It was 13 consecutive screens, slants, and quick speed outs, and that was it. They never opened up the offense again to attack down the field, and Auburn knew that they wouldn't open it back up, so they just sat on everything short, stopped the run with their amazing defensive line, and all of a sudden that Oregon offense ground to a complete halt. They never scored again, and the Ducks ended up losing that game while blowing a two-possession lead, all because their coaches, for whatever reason, didn't trust Justin Herbert to push the ball down the field. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. They did have a reason not to trust him. I'm trying to be nice because I don't want to kill the kid too much before he's even drafted, but yeah, they kind of had a reason not to trust him on those throws. We saw what happened when they tried to open up the offense again against Cal and ASU, and it was, in a word, rough. I think Herbert probably still has nightmares about Ashton Davis to this day because of all the damage he did to Oregon's offense deep down the field. Whether it was picking off Herbert on a ball that never ever should have been thrown against a match cover three, or obliterating Oregon's receivers with huge hits on late throws, Davis was everywhere in that game. But that being said, part of the reason why Davis was allowed to show out against Herbert in the first place was because Herbert kept making really, really dumb decisions. Take this inexcusably late throw up the seam from midway through the second quarter as an example. Cal is playing cover three yet again, and the read for a seam ball against cover three is honestly pretty simple, or at least it should be. If the apex defender carries number two up the seam, you turn and check it to the flat and let your running back go make a play in space against the linebacker. If the apex defender is not carrying the number two to the seam, however, and instead he's pointing his hips straight up the field at the running back, then you throw the seam behind him. Either way, as soon as Herbert's back foot hit on this drop, he should have been reading that defender and making a decision. 
His throwing motion needs to be starting right now if he wants to hit this window on time, especially since he's throwing it from the far hash, so both this boundary corner and Davis at free safety have even more time to recover with the ball in the air. He has to read this quickly and hit this throw in rhythm, but once again, he just doesn't do it. Instead, he bounces in the pocket for an extra half second, waiting for his receiver to be clearly open before he throws the ball, rather than throwing it before his receiver gets open like he's supposed to, and to add injury to insult, he leaves the ball way too deep, out of the soft spot, and makes his receiver drift straight into Ashton Davis for a huge shot to the ribs. I mean, this was as irresponsible a throw as it was late, and if he threw this exact pass in the NFL to say Keenan Allen or Devontae Parker, two veterans that know what a good seam ball is supposed to look like against cover three, they would f***ing hate him for making them take that hit. And he did that several times against Cal alone, constantly throwing his receivers into contact or into big collisions on the sideline that they did not need to take. It was so frustrating to watch because I know how much receivers, especially pro receivers, despise taking shots like that for no reason. Trust me, if he doesn't fix that once he gets into the NFL, if he doesn't speed up his processor, and if he doesn't stop leading guys into hits because of how late he is, that will be a problem for him in the locker room. I've seen that happen before. I just, I don't even know where to begin with listing off the red flags that I saw on tape with Herbert, especially when he was out of his comfort zone. He had multiple throws that ended up being big plays just out of sheer luck that defensive backs never turned their heads, or sheer luck that his receivers were able to win on jump balls that never, ever should have been thrown in the first place. A few of his biggest quote-unquote highlight plays of the year weren't really highlights, they were just shit that he happened to get away with, and the lowlights, man, they were really, really low. I mean, good God, some of those picks were ugly, especially in the Arizona State game, and it's really hard for me to just ignore those. I had multiple notes from that ASU game alone that were only one sentence long reading, I don't know what he was looking at here, and I don't think he did either. I mean, it was bad. And what made it all worse was that the Auburn, Cal, and ASU games were the first three games I watched. I was ready to write off Herbert completely because I hated his tape that much. But out of pure stubbornness, I guess you could say, I popped in one more just to see if maybe I was missing something. And that's when I saw it. I saw the one thing that almost single-handedly changed my mind in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Justin Herbert's game against Colorado. Other than Joe Burrow himself, Herbert made more highly impressive throws in that one Colorado game than any other quarterback prospect in any of their individual games in this entire draft class. He was flat out ridiculous. Whether it was in the pocket or out of the pocket, it didn't matter. He was dealing. And his stat line in that game doesn't even tell the whole story because he had to fight through several drops from his receiving core throughout the game. He was a completely different quarterback in that one matchup than he was during the rest of the season. So much so that it almost made me question my overall grade on him because I saw what he was capable of when everything was finally working. He went through progressions quickly, he was accurate, he was efficient. I mean, yeah, Colorado did have the 104th ranked defense in all of college football. They were terrible, I acknowledge that. But a good throw is a good throw, and he made a lot of good throws. And that's what makes Herbert such an incredible mystery to me, because we know the talent is there. We know that when he puts it all together, he's special. And for just a couple games a year, that special talent comes out, and we see what he's capable of but it's the other two or three games on the opposite end of the spectrum that make it really hard to reconcile that. I flat out don't know what to expect from Herbert as a pro because he's two different quarterbacks in one body. He's the one we saw against ASU and the one we saw against Colorado, but you never know which one's gonna show up in any given week. And that scares the hell out of me because the last guy I said that about, the last one that both gave me hope and made me hopeless simultaneously was Mitchell Trubisky. All the talent in the world, great athlete, hard worker, will flash a few games a year and look like a stud, but at the same time he's damn near coddled by his offensive system, slow to process coverages in front of him, and somehow inaccurate at the worst possible times. Does all of that sound familiar to you? If you're a Bears fan, it probably does, because that's exactly what Mitch Trubisky is. Except the difference between Trubisky and Herbert as prospects is that at least Mitch only started one year in college, so you can sort of explain his problems away as inexperience. But Herbert? He started four straight years for a major college program, and he's still this inconsistent. 
Look, I'm not gonna say definitively that he's not worth a first round pick because we've all seen the talent. Justin can make some throws that even Burrow and Tua can't make. He is that gifted. But all the stuff that makes Burrow and Tua so good in other ways, the quick processor, the accuracy, their ability to stay cool under pressure in big moments, I'm not so sure that Herbert has any of that right now. If you draft him, you're drafting him because you have complete and total faith that your coaching staff can elevate him enough to let his natural talent shine. You're drafting him because you know he should not start in 2020, and you have a plan in place to keep him from starting until he's ready. Herbert may still be a mystery right now, but that doesn't mean he's already a lost cause. After all, with every ugly Mr. Hyde, there's still a brilliant Dr. Jekyll in there somewhere. So if you're his future coaching staff in the pros, your path to success is honestly pretty simple. Not easy, mind you, but still simple nonetheless. Have faith, have patience, and have persistence. Because if you do, you may just solve this mystery.